Hey everyone, I'm Julie Gunlock, host of the Bespoke Parenting Hour. For those new to the program, this podcast is focused on how parents should custom tailor their parenting style to fit what's best for their families, themselves, and most importantly, their kids. Today, I'm thrilled to be joined by Jeremy Tate. He is the founder and CEO of the Classic Learning Test, an alternative to the SAT, ACT, and the PSAT. The CLT launched in 2015 with the aim of challenging the powerful influence of the mainstream testing establishment. As testing drives curriculum in education, the CLT aims to put students in front of the timeless text that shaped the thinking of America's founders. Jeremy is also the host of the Anchored Podcast. Prior to founding CLT, Jeremy served as Director of College Counseling at Mount DeSales Academy. Jeremy and his wife Erin reside in Annapolis, Maryland with their six children, which is great. Hey, Jeremy, thanks so much for coming on. Hey, Julie, thanks so much for having me. Well, I have followed you for a lot of years on Twitter, and I do encourage, and at the end of this, I'll ask you to give your Twitter account, but I encourage everyone to listen um, or to, to follow you on Twitter because you um, really give an interesting sort of perspective on education. And, and really today, you are sort of the alternative in education. And so um, I want, which I want to kind of get into that a little bit too. But my first question, and I think this is important for people who listen who might, you know, not really be, you know, in the education world. Um, sort of deeply steeped in this world and the academics of it. Um, so what is classical education? Yeah, Julie, thanks so much for having me. And that's a great question to, to start off with. What is, is classical education? And you know, I, I would describe it as, as one kind of education really as it kind of always was, really until kind of the, the end of the, the 19th century, or even the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, and so the idea with education was kind of two things, is that they were transmitting – uh, a body of knowledge, kind of, the, kind of the best of what had been thought and said, and they were doing that with the purpose, uh, the cultivation uh, of virtue. Uh, you, you see this in, fr- from Aristotle all the way down. That the purpose of education was really to—I uh, love the, the Plato quote actually—to um, teach people to love what is beautiful. Um, and I didn't hear that until I had been through, you know, an education major at Louisiana State until I had spent ten years in the classroom and kind of stumbled into classical education circles, and I hear this focus on beauty, uh, on truth, on the cultivation of virtue, uh, like the four cardinal virtues. And and what really did it for me was actually meeting these young people. Uh, they were just different. Uh, and in no way is that to bash any public school students. I met a ton of amazing families in the public school arena. But I, I felt like a lot of the most impressive students I met, it was because they were actually getting uh, at home what uh, schools used to provide, uh, the kind of the kind of discipline, the kind of moral formation, the kind of character development that I think yeah. really every parent wants for their kids. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, that I think this is a good way to segue to another question I have. You know, I feel like, and I started off saying, you know, you're the alternative, I mean, it's sad to say, but in some ways, classical education, sending your kids to a, a classic um, a school that uses classical education or homeschooling using the style of ed- educating is sort of new and sort of cutting edge, right? I feel like, you know, I certainly do that. I use a classical curriculum on my homeschool church. Ch- Ch- child and I, mm-hmm. um, I send my children. I specifically chose a classical um, private school for my other two, um, and I feel like you know I'm sort of on the the I'm I'm in the alternative um, sort of section or, or style of education. Mm-hmm. But this is this is how it used to be, right? This you talk about this um, you know push for virtue and to be good and to teach people to be sort of you know contributing. Um, parts of their community, people in their community. Um, it didn't used to, I, I, we can get into how education's changed, but this is really classical education. It used to be how everyone was educated in this country. Is that correct? That, that is so well said. And in fact, kind of that modifier, classical education, didn't really start to be used until yeah. 40 or 50 years ago, kind of the, the very you know end uh, of the 20th century. Uh, and so, and, and it really, I think what they were trying to do is kind of get back at uh, referencing the kind of education that sort of always was the case uh, until, you know, really about, a, you know, 100 years ago. And what's interesting to me, Julie, is it, w- it was never kind of like a decision that anybody made to break away from kind of traditional education. In fact, the education from the 4th century to the 15th century to the 18th century, it was kind of kind of looked very much the same. And then there was this departure that happened slow enough where 
people didn't really know what was going on or see it happening. But if we look at now what eighth graders were doing 100 years ago compared to today, yeah. it's really, really different. And I think part of it is because we're not uh, focusing on cultivating virtue, uh, the, the mm. kind of habits, the kind of formation of the mind that young people really need. What was that thing when you, you referenced, you know, about a hundred years ago? What was it? And, and again, I say this as someone who's, I'm, you know, I've suddenly found myself in this education space, obviously, like most people, because of COVID. It shut down. I had to make radical changes to my yeah. own family and that I've, 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 I haven't really, you know, I haven't talked to you about this, but I have. I've made radical, I was a public school parent fully mm. through, through my yep. children have only gone to public schools and now, Wow, we have really changed. And so I'm not an education scholar. I have really never studied the history of education in America. What was it that happened that changed it? Yeah, I think it was a couple things. You know, so one, you know, we would think, and it sounds great, uh, compulsory uh, education laws. You know, part of this is during the Industrial Revolution, there's a demand for more labor, especially factory kind of labor. Uh, this often meant that, that, you know, women were leaving the house. And we're, we're taking jobs in factories and that sort of thing. So you had compulsory education laws where you had limited resources. Um, and so you have, you know, 20, 25, 30 students in a class all of a sudden. And um, the kind of, I think, individual, smaller, uh, you know, it's interesting now that our, our universities give, give teachers a, a, a bachelor's of science. I think historically, right. you know, education would have been an art. Uh, it was a craft. Teaching was a mm. craft. Uh, and it's got to be individualized and focused and it takes a, a lot of work you know when you're working with so to kind of mass produce or to kind of do factory style and you know we saw that with the industrial revolution you know we got a bunch of goods and services but everything kind of became industrialized and and and, and made a bit like a factory that's part of what happened and so so it kind of became a least common denominator you know instead of having this rich transmission of you know the best that has been thought and said you know you can't really it's really difficult to kind of mass teach Latin or logic or rhetoric, um, and so these were these were kind of forgotten. Um, and I think also in place, you know, p- part of kind of the march of uh, I think very progressive ideology uh, as well that was a part of the of the 20th century. Yeah, in the 60s, I feel like everything kind of blew up in the, <laughs> in the 60s in this country, um, and a lot of sort of the social norms were sort of reversed or broken up or, or thought of as, as no longer sort of you know appropriate. I mean, was there? I feel like was there um, was education another uh, was was that sort of a flashpoint in the 60s as well, where there were all these new education theories? And again, you know, I'm I'm really not in uh, in the education space sort of as a career like that's not my the areas where I work and so it's interesting to me but I do you know but I'm a mom and so I hear things like Mm -hmm. you know like common core right like so I know that this was a sort of a an educate like a theory that got you know put into policy and then I've heard recently because it's funny now on Twitter I'm Follow, I'm actually following a whole bunch of people in the education space now because now I'm actually much more curious about it. But I've, I've heard things like there's new theories on when kids should start reading. I know in Europe, you know, they don't, they don't really get kids reading till they're much older. So were a lot of education theories and breaking away from the, what was left of the classical model. Was that, did that occur in the sixties and seventies? I think it did. And, and, you know, what's interesting is there wasn't a self-consciousness or even awareness of, like, classical was what we were doing. As you said a few minutes right. ago, classical is kind of just what education was, you know. Right. That's kind of kind of all of there was, and people understood it as a deep dive into this this tradition. Um, and so, you know, it's interesting when you look at the, the, the most influential Americans from Frederick Douglass, uh, John Adams, um, you know, Thomas Jefferson – they, Martin Luther King Jr., you know, mm-hmm. they had an education that was, was rooted. I mean, King's letter from a Birmingham jail is referencing, you know, Socrates multiple times. Right. Um, and so there was, there was a, and this also kind of created a basis as well for common culture. Um, yeah. And I think part of what has happened is, is I think there's been a well-intentioned, I do believe it's well-intentioned, uh, drive for multiculturalism. But that has also made people really hesitant to say, you know, we shouldn't give students too much of, you know, the Western tradition. We should give students a little bit of everything. But what it's actually meant for most students is that they're not getting a whole lot of anything. Uh, And, you know, the strange part about that, yeah, it's so paradoxical, but, you know, the best way to to appreciate America in some ways is to spend some time in another country. And you have kind of a point of comparison. 
Yeah. And it's the same way with classical education. You know, when you kind of do this, this time traveling that so many young people are doing now with the classical education, they're actually able to get a better sense of the present problems that we're facing, rather as if your whole education is only focused on the present. Yeah, it's interesting. My colleague Inez Felcher, who is very into, um, she's she is an education scholar. It's uh, you know funny how she talks when she talks about some some of the trends today of in education of sort of being rather anti-American. She always says, "I don't think these people have traveled much, right? Because um, mm-hmm. if you do even a small amount of travel, you know, I think most people mm-hmm. do a little bit of travel, and it's a wonderful experience to travel. But boy, you're happy to get home. And so I, I agree with you on that. But it is interesting about you know you you've said you know the class classical education wasn't really called that. It's not like in 1900 people were like, and, you know, we have a classical style here, right? So yeah. it's it's interesting to, to and I'm, I'm going to warn you, my dog is about to bark. So if you hear barking, I am not um, in a cage. We love I dogs have, here. Yeah. I have a, okay, I have a golden retriever who um, who really feels she needs to protect me at all times. So, um, but I, it's, it's interesting to me that when I describe this, like I had to talk to my parents about this. You know, I wanted to them mm. to, you know, understand what was going on. And they, you know, I said, I, I'm excited I picked out this, this classical curriculum for my oldest son. And it's interesting. He's always been my reader. He loves to read. You can sit him down. He'll be happy if you just sit him down all day with a book. So it was perfect for him. But when I was trying to describe, I was using sort of, you know, all this language that I'd read about. And then finally, I just said to my dad, dad, it's, it's kind of like how you were taught. Right. And he goes, Oh, he totally understood. You know, I said, you know, lots of memorization, lots of copy work, right? I said, these are the things Mm. that, you know, and, and tons of reading of Western, the sort of Western canon. And I, and, and he really, he, he understood that. And another example, and I just, I just want to share this because I think it's kind of an interesting story. I, when I started, we, when my son started the classical um, edu- the curriculum and, and I was homeschooling with him, I actually took – I went back a few grades and had him redo some subjects. And one of those was language mm-hmm. arts. And, you know, I yeah. had him actually memorizing the grammar rules, right, which you th- – and I will tell you, you know, I – Jeremy, I started to get really nervous about my kids' education in um, mm-hmm. in their elementary years, because I started to say, aren't they supposed to be memorizing like these things? And I noticed that they weren't, yeah. they didn't know them. So when I had my son go back a few steps, a few grades, and we, we went and he, he reviewed a lot that first year that we were homeschooling. And he memorized all mm-hmm. the grammar rules. And he was so proud of himself. And he said to me one day quietly, he said, you know, mom, you used to always buy us Mad Libs. And I said, yeah, I, I know. And they would all, they would never be played. You guys would never pick them up and play with them. And he goes, mom, I, I really wasn't sure of what an adjective was or what an adverb was because mm. it, for those, for those not mm-hmm. familiar with ad, mad, mad libs, they're so fun. You, they just, they put a noun in, put an adjective in, put, and then you, you put in silly things and then pretty soon, you know, your, you know, your dog is walking your mom, you know, or something like that. It's, a, it's these kind of, it makes these crazy sentences because you just mm. put a noun in or an adjective. And he didn't know. And he said, you know, I always felt like, and he said, I always felt like I should, but they weren't Mm, teaching me that. And so now with his classical education, you know, again, the memorization, just memorizing the, the grammar rules and memorizing, you know, different, different, you know, rules Mm. about grammar and about language. Um, he's in a much better place. And that is again, because of classical education, which again is like what I described to my dad, how kids used to be taught. And Julia, so, I love that you share that story. I mean, we're, we're kind of actually new to it as well. I kind of discovered it myself six or seven years ago. Yeah. And our kids have only been in classical schools now for about, I guess this is their fourth or fifth year. Oh, okay. um, but you know, I think it's some of the stories and the things that we've experienced as a family and, and my boys, you know, even this, this year, we took them from a classical homeschool model into a great brick and mortar school, Divine Mercy Academy. And the teachers have incredibly high standards for handwriting, for, for penmanship, yes. for beautiful yes. cursive. And my boys were banging their head against the table. They didn't <laughs> want to do it. And they are so proud. I mean, it's only November, but they're so proud of their yeah. handwriting now. And, you know, one of the things that happened in mainstream that is this kind of wholesale adoption of kind of what I, I would just call utilitarianism has been adopted, where the mindset is, if they're not going to use it, why should we teach it? Yeah. And so if that's the mindset. It's very difficult to justify something like Latin or yes. penmanship or, you know, uh, um, but but if you actually meet someone who is, you know, well-trained in Latin or somebody who has beautiful penmanship, you start to notice some patterns of, wow, 
this person seems like a very observant person. This person's a very attentive person. This is a detail-oriented kind of person. It actually cultivates uh, these, these disciplines, these virtues, um, and yes. that's, I think, really what we need to get back to. Yeah, it's funny that you bring up Latin. My children have had to start Latin this year, and I got a lot of um, sort of complaints, but now they're getting to the point where they like to say things to each other that my husband and I don't know, so they've turned that into a certain, uh, a little bit of a secret language between them, which I find very amusing. But the pride that they have, I will tell you that's another thing that I've noticed. You know, this is my children's first year learning uh, Latin, for instance, and um Mm-hmm. And they ha- they are so proud of themselves because they've actually had to catch up to some of their their um their the other students who have had it for longer, and they feel very proud that they've been able to to catch up and keep up and and you know there's other other things that they're really you know proud of learning and and I think that they're actually enjoying the school more. One of, my mm-hmm. son got stressed out because he couldn't find a an assignment, and the teacher taught him a prayer um while he was kind of freaking out and having you know sort of anxiety about not being able to find this she said let's let's slow down and i'm going to teach you a prayer and he said it around the house and so these these virtues that they're teaching them you know how to sort of coping mechanism involving prayer to to get through a stressful moment was something i'd Mm -hmm. never you know obviously i'd never seen that happen in the the public schools but um but i i see what you mean about those virtues is teaching them it goes it goes so far beyond just what they're learning in the classroom that day. It teaches them to really be good people mm. um, and good citizens. So it's been really wonderful. I want to I want to pivot a little bit though, um, and and talk a little bit about your your company CTL, um, the classic learning test. I am really fascinated about this. Can you tell? Mm. Me, you know, sort of, I, you know, there's a, there's some great information you have in your website, but tell the listeners, why was it necessary to start this new company and to start a classic learning test that competes with some of these other sort of co- college prep tests? Yeah, I love this question so much. Obviously, love to talk about CLT. People, you know, initially come sort of assume, man, this is going to be boring. We're going to talk about standardized testing. Like, who cares? But it's actually standardized testing is this incredibly powerful kind of lever that controls really American education, right? And so, you know, I think most teachers I talk to will agree that high stakes testing, uh, standardized testing tends to dictate and derive what happens in the classroom, Mm -hmm. right? And so like for a a private secondary school, how do they market themselves? Well, they market themselves based on their PSAT scores, their SAT scores, their AP course offerings, their AP average scores, right? It's all controlled by the college board, right? Well, what what is college board about? And college board is, is... very, I'd say, radically disconnected from the kind of education that, that gave birth to America, the kind that 100% of America's founders had. So the idea with CLT is, well, what if there was an alternative to college board that instead of driving uh, educational curricular focus away from tradition was actually encouraging and encouraging affluency with this tradition instead? Um, and so we rolled out competitive tests to the SAT, to the PSAT, uh, and it's been really fun because, you know, there, there is a rapidly growing movement. Um, and I think the movement was fragmented for a, a number of years. You had classical homeschooling taking off in the Catholic world and in the Protestant world and in, you know, non, non-Christian or religious people. But then you also had the classical charters launching. And then a lot of Catholic schools kind of re-embracing their Catholic identity, which includes re-embracing the tradition of the church, which is the classical tradition. And I think really just within the past few years, all of these movements have kind of gotten locked up together. And I think CLT has been kind of a big part of that. Our academic board, we've tried to kind of grab people and influencers from all of these various spheres. Uh, and so I think CLT is serving as kind of the lowest common denominator where if you're a classical charter or you're homeschooling, um, you know, CLT may be one of those things that you have in common. Um, and it's a way to actually gauge, well, you care about classical literature, you care about your, your students reading philosophy, how do they do reading philosophy? And so we're putting students in front of those kinds of texts rather than, you know, often just the meaningless text that college yeah. board uses or often the very, very biased. I mean, college board love Bernie or hate Bernie. College board's putting Bernie Sanders on the SAT two years ago. Yeah. You know, um, rather, why not Frederick Douglass? Why not yeah. Ben Franklin? You know, right. uh, instead. So these, these tests are very, very political. Are they, are they, are, t- are colleges recognizing this new to this classical learning test in, p- in place of these other tests? 
They are, yes. There's about 200 partner colleges. Uh, Hillsdale is our, our closest partner uh, right. right now, and um, about 200. A lot of, now, a lot of schools, though, went test optional during COVID. A lot will stay test optional, but uh, a lot of top schools, they still do tie test scores, CLT scores, uh, to top scholarships. And so, you know, and actually, CLT, we're actually very for the test optional movement. I understand, actually, that testing can be anxiety-provoking, yeah, for yeah. a lot of young people, but there's also a lot of young people who they're really excited to kind of show off what they can do. Yeah. Um, yeah. And a test like the CLT is a great way to showcase that. That's that's amazing. You know, I uh, you know I want to to end this on a good note, but I do have one more question. Um, and and you know I don't know if you're like me, but goodness, I I feel like I have a little bit of CRT fatigue. I'm so tired of talking about that. It, right. But it is. Yeah. Do you feel that way? I feel like I'm so tired of talking about this. and But it is important, and it is still in the schools. Mm. And, you know, it's interesting, Jeremy. I left the public schools, and there is a part of me that just doesn't want to think about it anymore, right? I want to kind mm-hmm. of take Rod Dreyer's, you know, um, Benedict option, right? I want to make my little house, yeah, you know, have have my little house, and, you know, we have movie night, and, and then send them off to school, and they're in the safe space. And I don't want to think about some of the bigger issues because it, it is – upsetting to me what's going on in the public Mm. schools and it's upsetting to me that so many children are trapped in those schools don't have a mom Mm -hmm. that works from home don't have the their families don't have the finances to afford two private school tuitions um Mm -hmm. or fam or family to help them and so i that's why i am still involved and i think you are too i've heard i've seen you on twitter you are very always so civilized and polite i can't say the same for myself um but i but you are always so civilized and polite but you do talk about these issues what's going on in the schools you do you do touch on them and i i saw one post that you made about crt and why it doesn't fit um into mm. a classical structure um and i'd love you to s- T- touch on that a little bit. Maybe you, know, you have to say exactly what you said, but I'm not keeping track. But I, but I, lo- I you know, it, when I talk hmm. to people about my children going to this new classic, you know, they use they use the curriculum that the school actually uses, Memoria Press, and I was so excited because I use Memoria Press for my homeschooled child. And there's a million. I I, that's it. not a yeah. that's that's not a plug. Believe me, that is not a plug. But I will plug Memoria. I mean, I, that's not like a. I get nothing to say Memorial Press, but I will literally plug Memorial. <laughs> I love it so much. I feel like it saved me a they're, little. They're because, dear friends. Oh, they're, they're yeah. oh, I'm so glad to hear that. And they're wonderful, and they make it very very easy for new homeschoolers. But you know, I I sort of mm. feel like I, I, I and then I chose this this pri- private school that uses Memorial Press and is a classical has a classical approach, and I know that my kids are safe there. And one of the reasons is CRT can't possibly be used in that kind of setting so tell me why tell me why this is a a way for parents to keep your kids a little bit if you choose a school that employs this style of learning you might keep them a little safe from this stuff yeah yeah i love that you know i think the irony with it too is that that a lot of the classical schools that i know really well they're they're actually reading uh, a lot more black history they're reading more frank douglas they're reading they're reading du bois mlk they're actually getting a much deeper understanding right. uh, of America's story around uh, slavery and race um, than having a, a modern uh, ideology kind of being uh, impressed upon them. And so, you know, I think because the classical school, uh, the focus of the school is, is, I would say, in many ways, creating agency for young people, you know, uh, empowering them through the transmission uh, of this beautiful tradition um, and, you know, with that, I think part of, partly what's kind of embedded within uh, CRT is, is a victimhood ideology, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, you know, no doubt, like, you, you know, you can make a case that, that America is unfair, that, that some, some students are at an advantage and other students are at a disadvantage. Sure. But, you know, what I experienced when I was a teacher in inner city New York uh, is that it was actually the teachers who grew up in inner city. I was at a school in Brooklyn. Um, who were the ones who didn't like uh, this, this victimhood ideology, that it was actually a lot of the very young, very affluent progressive teachers uh, that were, were bringing in, uh, that were coming yeah. in and, and letting the students know everything was stacked against them. And, you know, this was a school that was 100% minority student. And I remember one, one of the teachers in particular, Dr. Mr. Wilk- Wilkerson, you know, would pull some of the young teachers aside and be like, stop, like this is, th- these students <laughs> need to understand that they can, they can do anything, anything, that nothing nothing can stop them. Uh, that they're not fighting a system that's set against them, that this is, you know, um, so, 
Yeah, I think it's, it's having a focus. I mean, there is a void that was left when we got rid of core knowledge, when we got rid of this idea that we're transmitting this body of knowledge, the classics, the canon to the next generation. We got rid of that, it left a void. And I think yeah. CRT is many, one of many things that is kind of trying to fill that space. Yes, that's that's really well said, and I loved what you you have. So I've heard you talking about classical education is is passing on beauty, um, at the transmission of a treasure. I've heard you say. I'm not sure I'm saying that absolutely be- correctly, but this the sentiment is there that that that's what I feel like my children are learning, um, and and the virtues of being a good person. I I think are are really being talk to my children and I'm, I'm, I'm so thrilled. I do want to, I like to leave my podcast on a happy note and I have to tell you when I was researching and putting together my show script, I always, you know, sort of have my questions laid out and I had put your bio in, but I had, fi- and I found, and I, you know, I read, I read your very, you know, official sounding bio, but earlier I had found another bio and I want to read it because it's so much better. It's much shorter, but it's so much better. And obviously it's an old bio because it says you're the father of five children. So you've since had a sixth <laughs> child. So it says Jeremy Wayne Tate is a happy father of five children. He's a former high school educator and current homeschooler and the founder of the classic learning test. His favorite book is Chesterton's Orthodoxy, right? So intellectual, right? And his favorite movie is Dumb and Dumber. And that made me howl. I thought that was so funny. I think you are a very, very well-rounded person, Jeremy. And uh, I'm so glad you came on today uh, to talk to us about this really important topic. Hey, Julie, this has been a lot of fun. Thanks uh, for for all the great work y'all are doing at Independent Women's Forum and uh, happy to chat anytime. That's great. Well, stay in touch and thanks again for coming on. Thanks everyone for being here for another episode of the Bespoke Parenting Hour. If you enjoyed this episode or like the podcast in general, please leave a rating or review on iTunes. This helps ensure that the podcast reaches as many listeners as possible. If you haven't subscribed to the Bespoke Parenting Hour on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts, please do so so you won't miss an episode. Don't forget to share this episode and let your friends know that they can get Bespoke episodes on their favorite podcast app. From all of us here at the Independent Women's Forum, thanks for listening.